please stand and join me in body or in spirit for the call to worship. In the deepening darkness, in the shadow of the cross, we gather in the name of Christ. Order our steps to follow you wherever the path may lead. Cleanse our feet to show us how to serve as your disciples in the world. Teach us your commandment so we may love as you have loved. Gather us now in your holy name. Friends, in today's scripture passage, Jesus gives the disciples a new commandment, to love one another as he has loved us. It sounds easy, but we know that it's not. And that is why we need this moment of confession. For in confession, we are honest about the truth of our lives, and God meets us with grace, wiping the slate clean, just like Christ washed our feet. And there's little more powerful than that. So friends, join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin and visible on your screen, trusting in the grace of our God. Let us pray together. Eternal God, whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we fail to fulfill your will. Though you have bound yourself to us, we will not bind ourselves to you. In Jesus Christ, you serve us freely, but we refuse your love and withhold ourselves from others. We do not love you fully or love one another as you commanded. In your mercy, forgive and cleanse us. Lead us once again to your table and unite us to Christ, who is the bread of life and the vine from which we grow in grace.
family of faith. Just as Jesus washed the dirt off his disciples' feet, Jesus washes the past off of us. We are made new. So hear and believe the good news of the gospel. Here in this place, those of us who are broken are made whole. Those of us who are lonely are welcomed into family. Those of us who have done wrong are forgiven and sent to serve. In Jesus Christ, we are healed, forgiven, and welcomed. Thanks be to God for a love like that. God's grace does not exist only for us, it exists for our neighbors as well. So trusting in that grace, we greet one another in the passing of peace, celebrating the way that God binds us together. So friends, I invite you to greet your neighbors with a handshake, a hug, or a high five. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Online friends, peace of Christ be with you. We wish you a happy Holy Week and you're so glad you're joining us tonight. Peace of Christ be with you, online family. We're so glad you're here. I saw you handled it well. <laughs> Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ and welcome to Maundy Thursday services here at Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church. A special welcome to any who are visiting with us this evening and to members of our extended family who are worshiping with us online. It's uh, been a strange day here in uh, Midtown New York. Uh, as far as I can tell, uh, the last three presidents of the United States and the current president of the United States are all within a few blocks of this building tonight, which means just getting here is a sort of an act of great faithfulness and patience. So bless you uh, for working your way uh, through the cordoned off areas and uh, the many uh, members of NYPD Blue to make your way to uh, these services. I just have uh, two really sets of announcements tonight. The first is to invite you to come back as Holy Week continues uh, tomorrow at 12 o'clock noon in this space. We will observe Good Friday with a service that will walk step by step through the passion of Christ. It is a contemplative service that involves lots of silence, a rare thing in this world and in this city, beautiful, gorgeous uh, music for the season, and seven homilies by uh, the clergy of this church and our seminary interns as we think about the meaning of the suffering and death of Christ together. And then on Easter Sunday, um, in two identical services, the first at 9.30 in the sanctuary and the second at 11.15 in the sanctuary, and online, we will have a glorious Easter celebration. And you are invited, if you are here in the city, to bring flowers, to stop at your local kiosk or bodega on your way into church, and to bring some blooms and 
the cross that you will see later in this service will be out on Fifth Avenue, and we will participate together in that wonderful Easter tradition, the flowering of the cross. Now a few words about this evening's service. There's a lot that goes on in a Maundy Thursday service, and really, our service has four parts to it. And the first of the four parts is a homily in which we reflect on the traditional story of Maundy Thursday at which the disciples have gathered together with Jesus and he engages in foot washing. And uh, our own Reverend Natalie Owens Pike will be preaching the homily for that service of the word. And then we have a reaffirmation of baptism um, one of the convictions of Christians for centuries has been that what gives us the courage to walk the road of uh, Holy Week with our Lord is the waters of baptism, the blessing that we get from these waters. And so we will remind ourselves and live into, lean into um, that, uh, that identity together here tonight. And then another part of the Maundy Thursday service is celebrating the Lord's Supper, communion together. And we will gather at the table for the feast of our Lord, the feast that he celebrated before his passion. And finally, we will conclude the service this evening with a tenebrae service. Tenebrae is the Latin word for darkness. And as we read, uh, the story of the Passion together tonight, um, each reader will then be extinguishing a candle on the communion table until there's only one candle left and the lights in the sanctuary are going to get dimmer and dimmer and dimmer until after the final uh, reading, that last candle will be carried out of the sanctuary and we will sit together in darkness until another Latin word for you, the sounding of the strepitus. And strepitus is a Latin word that means loud noise. And classically, the strepitus begins when the pulpit Bible is slammed shut. So I'm going to be up here in the darkness trying not to crush the microphone, but slap the Bible closed together. And when that happens, the congregation, the choir, the organ all participate in making a loud noise. And classically that's been done by the stomping of feet, sometimes by clapping of hands, and sometimes by taking your hymnal and banging it on the pew in front of you. Now, the danger about that, I'm looking at like Matt over here, <laughs> is that you miss the, because it's dark, the, the back of the pew in front of you and you hit somebody. So don't hit anybody with your hymnals when we're making the strepitus. What is, why are we making the strepitus? The strepitus is the symbolic loud noise that happened at the moment of Christ's death when the veil in the temple was torn. And, uh, and so we'll make the strepitus until the strepitus kind of naturally dies down and becomes quiet. And then the light will return and you will hear the benediction and you will be invited to linger here as long as you would like, but to depart in silence because Tonight really is the beginning of all these services that culminate in Easter. And so um, to take, take the meaning of the evening with you as you go. So bless you, dear friends, those present, those online in this holy week. Now let us get those feet solid on the ground Take a deep breath and turn our hearts and our minds toward the story of this evening and worship of our holy God.
Friends, in our Lenten sermon series this year, we have sought out stories of resilience of the spirit in our tradition. Resilience in the crowd who lauded Christ as he paraded into Jerusalem on a lowly donkey. Resilience in the woman who sought a healing miracle after years of struggle. Resilience in the faithfulness of the apostles following Jesus step by step. And tonight, we seek resilience in the scripture of Maundy Thursday. As Jesus prepares for his arrest and death, Jesus humbles himself to wash the feet of the disciples, showing us, teaching us, how to live out his new commandment. What does this scripture ask of us as we aspire to follow Jesus? Will it challenge us to receive the tender love of Christ, our servant, who lifts our feet to be washed? Or does it ask us to live the charge the disciples receive, to do for each other this task of love, this kneeling in servanthood without looking away? Will you please pray with me as we wonder together? Holy One, as we walk with you toward the cross, guide our feet. We thank you that you took on flesh to be with us, that you teach us through these bodies we share how to show up for each other in love. God, be with us now to interrupt our resistance. Inspire us to serve as you served, to love as you loved. Amen. Hear now the word of God as it comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 15. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and returned to the table. He said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done for you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I do a lot of reading during my commute here to church on the train, and I listen to podcasts too. And I'm always delighted that I can do these two things at once. I can be on my way to work and also be learning. And this week, my learning reinforced what I've been hearing from some of you, that we are living in lonely times. 
Across this country, we are hungry for connection, for communities, and for relationships where we can bring the fullness of who we are to be cared for and to be understood. I listened this week to our Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, speak with Krista Tippett on her podcast, On Being. Dr. Murthy described an epidemic of loneliness, a threat to American health equal in severity than any other public health crisis that we face. Equal in severity. More than half of Americans today report feeling lonely. And this loneliness, it is making us sick. It's literally breaking our hearts, leading to greater risk of heart disease, physical illness, and early death, with an impact many times more than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And this isolation, as you might imagine, has political consequences too. A Cambridge University Press study found recently that Americans' core networks are significantly smaller and more politically homogenous than any other period in our history. Our systems of government cannot function in such levels of polarity, you might recognize the gridlock it creates. And the less time that we spend with people who we differ from, the easier it is for us to drift towards extremism. But perhaps this is a case I don't have to make to you, my friends, because alongside my fellow pastors up here, we have heard you tell us these truths in your own words and in your own stories as you seek community here. So did it strike you as it did for me to re-hear or re-read this story of Jesus and his disciples with this community-wide loneliness in mind? Jesus spent his final hours before his arrest and death together in close community showing his disciples how to serve each other in his absence, building a bridge for them into the active how of Christian love and discipleship we are called to. Our gospel writer makes sure that we hear that Jesus knew his time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. Jesus knew he would leave the disciples and he gave them actions of service so that his love would endure all the way down to us in these lonely times. So in this service of Maundy Thursday, we honor this mandatum, Latin for commandment, which refers to John 13:34 which is just a few verses after the scene we encounter, where Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another. This is a vision of resilience that comes through serving each other and crucially allowing ourselves to be served in love. But the disciples don't accept this teaching smoothly. No, they remind us of a very human struggle to follow as Jesus commands. They resist his gentle care of their road-ravaged feet. They say, incredulous, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replies, you do not realize now what I am doing but later you will understand. They resist using words like never. They question again, will you wash not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well? I wonder who you see yourself as in this moment. Would you resist this act of love? Or would you jump at the opportunity to be zealous, to be seen as most worthy, wash my hands and head as well. 
Now, I have to confess, I'm grateful that we don't do the literal service of foot washing tonight, <laughs> but I do love that this story centers around our feet, this area of our body that we might have shame over, that we take care to cover up. Our feet, they bear us up and they look the part, don't they? You too might have blisters or weathering or scars. You cannot look away from the path someone has trodden by looking at their feet. And these disciples, they've been following Jesus step by step, and I bet that their feet show it. Each callus and blister, the dirt under each nail telling their story, they have accumulated this texture of life, going from town to town, preaching the gospel of Jesus and this message of love, denouncing the power hungry and the greed of the empire. They have followed him on foot, and now they can't believe he will kneel to strip the grime they've gathered on their way here. Take a look at your bulletin cover tonight. These painted feet show veins and wounds and hair and toenails, all this evidence of our humanness. But in between, we see bright threads of streaming gold, the alchemy of sacred healing touch that Jesus shares in seeing all of who we are, knobby toes and all, and holding us with love in the process. Thinking back to our Surgeon General and his concern for all of our well-being, Dr. Murthy noted that early in our human history, when we lived as packs of roving hunter-gatherers, there those of us who tried to go it alone just wouldn't survive. Away from the pack, we would be eaten by a predator. And yet, so many hundreds of years later, though we have been taught by the conditions of our economy and our world that it is our individual efforts that matter more than the whole, or that we earn our most valuable reward when we go it alone, it is Dr. Morthy who reminds us we have the same nervous system today that we did back then. When we receive signals over time of the stress of loneliness, our body gets the message we are missing something crucial for our survival. We remember in our bodies that we need our pack to survive. This resilience cannot be found in our individual efforts alone. No, our resilience and our sustenance lie in the upper room with our community lie in the warmed bowl of water, in the hands of the kneeling king, in the vulnerability of removing the armor of our shoes, and yes, even our stinky socks, and saying, yes, my Lord, you can cradle my feet. Yes, my Lord, I too will kneel to serve the ones I love. Yes, we will get down on the floor in the mess and the dirt of our lives to offer each other the naked gnarls of our blistered feet, and we will offer each other, too, clean water, fresh towels, just a few moments where I lift your burden from the earth, where you, too, are held in loving hands. These are the steps of our faithful feet, taking up the commandment of the Christ who sees the cross before him. Love one another. Love in ways that honor our doubt and vulnerability, and yes, even love yourselves this way. Love by receiving this gesture of love. Love knowing nothing you do can separate you from this love, not the doubt of Simon, the betrayal of Judas, the denial of Peter. Love knowing it will not be easy to love in this way. Many of you know that I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, 
So my feet spent most of the year from about October to May shoved into the soft warmth of a winter boot. But there was always this moment when spring finally came as a kid and we ran around barefoot for the very first time on our soft winter feet. And now that I live in Brooklyn, I would never do this barefoot, but the sidewalk in Minneapolis is just a little different. When you've just taken your soft winter feet out of those boots, you have no calluses to protect you and you feel every stick, every rock, every tiny pebble underfoot. And we did all this running tender footed across our city yards, some because we wanted to look tough to the fellow neighbor kids, of course, but some because we knew, like every other spring, there would come a moment where we wouldn't feel so exposed to every rocky bit of ground. We'd have our summer souls again. We would be used to it. We'd run across the street and not even notice those sharp tacks of loose asphalt that used to sting. It would be like second nature to go about with no shoes. So take heart if this commandment leaves you feeling tender-footed today, wondering where this support will come from or how hard it might be for you to kneel to offer it. Learning as we are in this scripture that serving one another in love means we have to change the posture that we're used to, the one that we're comfortable in. We might be like Simon Peter resisting the tender care of the one we think we should be supporting. Or maybe we might rather kneel, holding up the feet of those we love, tender-footed to the receiving of a love this wide, this forgiving, this bold. But this is what we learn through the stories of our faith. We can admit where we do not yet fully understand. We can accept the growing pains of concrete under tender feet, trusting that someday it might be like second nature to us. So as we turn our looking towards the cross, let us listen for the loving Christ who asks, will you kneel to serve your neighbor? Will you let yourself be held? Family of faith, will you rise and join me in the prayer for the day? printed in your bulletin or seen on your screen. God, who kneels to wash our feet, we give you thanks for this night Christ shared with his disciples. Help us now, even as we do not fully understand, to follow in Christ's footsteps. For Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Help us to serve as Jesus served, to love as Jesus loved, until the day of our reconciliation in you. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Tonight, 
we will partake of the Last Supper with the disciples. Tonight, we will hear the story of the trial, the suffering, and the death of Jesus. Tonight, we will prepare for this difficult journey by remembering the covenant that God has made with us in our baptisms. And for those who have not been baptized, in the blessing of water. Brothers and sisters, we have been claimed by God through the waters of the font, the river, the pool, the lake. Through these waters, we've been embraced by a faith that gives us courage and strength for this night and for every day in the journey of life. Let us pray. Eternal and gracious God, we give you thanks. In countless ways, you revealed yourself in ages past. We praise you that through the waters of the sea, you led your people Israel out of bondage and into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. We praise you that in these waters you have washed us, you have claimed us, you have joined us to the death and the resurrection of Christ. These sacred waters do give us courage to follow Jesus to the foot of the cross. They give us the courage to wait for good news on Easter morning and on this blessed night, may they also give us the courage to embody your love and compassion as we kneel to serve others and as we seek to have the boldness to allow ourselves to be so served. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Water cleanses. Water purifies, water refreshes, water sustains. Jesus Christ is the living water. May your lives be cleansed, purified, refreshed, and sustained for the journey whenever you feel the touch of water. Friends, remember your baptism and live into this promise tonight and always. Remember your baptism and be thankful. Hybrid family, remember your baptism and be thankful.
I need windshield wipers for my glasses. <laughs> Friends, all that we have and all that we are are gifts from God, from our life to our breath, our friendship and financial resources. God has blessed us. We give not as though we can pay God back. We give out of gratitude. And one of the ways that this church uses your gifts is to support a place at the table. This meal ministry provides a warm, nutritious meal to our hungry and homeless guests on Mondays and Wednesdays outside of the church, just right out here on West 55th Street. Alongside the over 800 meals served each month, a place at the table offers a lifeline to those on the margins. It opens the doors to case management, housing and health and mental health services, and other essential services provided by the Ecumenical Outreach Partnership. A place at the table is one example of the many ways that your gifts to Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church further God's work in the world. Now, during the offertory anthem, officers will be passing the plate to accept your gifts, but you can also make your offering online. You will find a QR code printed on the back of your bulletin, or if you're worshiping with us online, there is a QR code that will be coming on your screen right now. Scan this code using the camera of your smartphone and follow the instructions to make a secure donation to our ministries. Thank you so much for your generosity.
please pray with me. Holy, loving God, on this Maundy Thursday, as we remember the last night that Jesus spent around a table with his friends, as we contemplate the image of Christ washing their feet, we humbly bring to you these tithes and our offerings. Today and every day, may we take on a posture of humble generosity where we can see one of your children hurting, lost, or forgotten, may we be ready to kneel beside them and reach for a basin and a towel. For the ones we don't see, may our gifts and offerings to the ministry of this church be used to reach them. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, it makes sense that one of the last things Jesus would do with his disciples is feed them. It makes sense because Jesus was always feeding people, tax collectors and hungry crowds, children and eager disciples. Jesus was always nourishing crowds, breaking bread, extending the table wider. Because in God's house, all are welcome and all are fed. So tonight, come back to the table. Come and know that there is a seat saved for you. Come and let it feel holy. Let it feel revolutionary. For where else can all be welcomed and all be fed? Come and remember, this table, Christ's body, is for you. All are welcome here. Friends, join me in prayer. God of today and tomorrow, God of ordinary bread and juice, God of extraordinary hope and sorrow, we are running to this table. We come running to this table, O oh God, because we are hungry. We are hungry for justice. We are hungry for mercy. We are hungry for a place to belong and a love that knows our names. We are hungry for bread, just like we're hungry for roses. We are hungry to see and know you. So Christ, we come running. And as we do, we trust that just like every time before, you meet us here. For like Peter, we don't want you to simply wash our feet. We want you to wash our head and our hands. We want to be closer to you. So with all the tenderness and honesty we can muster, we bring our whole hearts to this table. And with humility, we admit that we don't understand it all. This week rocks us. It unravels us, it pulls on our fickle hearts, but with faith the size of a mustard seed and small acts of resiliency, we turn our eyes towards you. So thank you, Jesus of Nazareth, for modeling what resilient love looks like. Thank you for feeding not only the saint, but also the sinner. Thank you for gifting us with this ordinary ritual that connects us across time and space to you, but also to every faithful heart that has gone before. Thank you, God, for feeding us. And with feet at this table, and with eyes turned towards the cross, we pray to you, using the words your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you in the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. For every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. Friends, this evening communion will be offered to you at three different stations across the front of the sanctuary. Ushers will indicate when you should head down the aisle, inviting you to stick to the right side to avoid traffic jams. When you get to the front, we will place a gluten-free wafer in your hand, which you can respond by receiving and saying thanks be to God. Then the next person will hand you a cup of juice, and you can respond the same. Thanks be to God. Before you return to your pew, there are um, recycling bins at the head of the aisle where you can dispose of your juice cup. If you are unable to come forward, then simply let your usher know and we will gladly bring the elements to you. Live stream friends, if you have um, signed up to partake in communion online, you can join Reverend Natalie in the Zoom room now. Friends, the table is ready. It is wide. The feast is for you. So come.
Please pray with me. Jesus of Nazareth, Rabbi, teacher, there are a million other places we could be, but tonight we wanted to be here. Tonight we needed to be here, online and in person, worshiping together on this Maundy Thursday. And as we remember your final meal, our hearts are full of gratitude. Thank you for welcoming us to your table. Thank you for turning our scarcity into abundance. Thank you for tethering yourself to bread and cup, ordinary things that we see every day, so that not a day might pass where we can't feel you near. Holy God, you are manna in the wilderness, and we are overcome. With full hearts and spirits we pray, amen. Please be seated. The first reading 
the shadow of betrayal, Matthew 26, verses 20 through 25. When it was evening, he took his place with the 12 disciples. And while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him one after another, surely not I, Lord. He answered, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl will betray me. The son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. Here ends the reading. The second reading, the shadow of inner agony, Luke 22, verses 40 through 44. When he reached the place, he said to them, pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Here ends the reading. The third reading, the shadow of loneliness, Matthew chapter 26, verses 40, 45. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me for one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? 
Now the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Here ends the reading. This is the fourth reading, The Shadow of Desertion, Matthew 26, verses 47 to 50, and then 55 and 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the disciples, arrived with him a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had also given them a sign, saying, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a rebel? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Here endeth the reading. The fifth reading, The Shadow of Accusation, Matthew 26, 59 through 67. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. The high, uh, the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer? What is it that, the, that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I will put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. 
What do you think? They answered, he deserves death. Then they spat in his face and struck him and slapped him. Here ends the reading. The sixth reading, the shadow of mockery, Mark 15, verses 12 to 20. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his head with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Here ends the reading. The seventh reading, the shadow of death, Luke 23, 33 through 46. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, 
This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly for what we are getting, what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and the darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said that, he breathed his last. Here ends the reading. Followers of Christ, 
children of God, depart from this place in peace and look, look, look for the coming of the light. Amen.